morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Appreciate the presence for everyone. We're, we're in this study about a more excellent way, right? And talking about how, how if we let love motivate and be behind all of our actions, all of our relationships, the various circumstances we find ourselves in life, uh, we'll be better. Um, things will, will work out better. Our relationships will be better. Everything gets better. So says the Lord, right? And through the Apostle Paul who says this is the more excellent way. Um, and, and we've been trying to make specific application in this study of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 directly to family situations. The, the, the home life, the, 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 the physical family circumstances that we find ourselves in. And uh, we've been making application to the spiritual family of God as well. Because these texts and these thoughts apply really in so many different areas. And we could... We could Right, we could take these, these principles and just start putting applications into just about any and every uh, circumstance you can imagine. So I've honed that in, talking strictly about families, but I am talking about both physical and spiritual families. And I listed in your notes that, that we're still in Lesson 1. It's, if you're looking at that outline that we handed out, it's Lesson 1, Section 2. Point to C. So if you can follow an outline form, so look for Roman numeral 2, that's I-I for those who don't speak Roman. Is that a language? Anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then look for the number 2, the one you're normally used to seeing, and the letter C that I think hasn't changed in a couple generations. So, so that's where we're at um, in our study, and it'll look a little different. Again, I'm showing you a PowerPoint system that I use to navigate through. The, the material is exactly the same on the screen. You just won't see those outline markings, but it's exact same thoughts on the screen as what's in your hand. So, so, so um, there's no variation as it relates to that. Nothing new is going to come up on the screen that, that isn't in your hands as well. This is just to help me kind of guide through uh, the study because that's the way I've done it um, in the past. And I told you I originally preached this series. I didn't. This originally was not written... Um, as a Bible class, this material was originally written to just for me to preach these, these lessons, but I thought it might be good for us to bring them out and let you discuss them as well in our study. Okay, so, so here, here's where I want to go back, and I actually can go back one slide here for you, because right towards that section, we talked about the fact that our families, it's the bottom of our, my screen if you're looking at it, our families need to know we serve God out of love and that He desires of others. And we talked about that a little bit out of John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And we emphasized that very end of our study last Sunday before I left. And we talked about the fact that, that our families, our, our spiritual, our physical families, and as they encounter us on a regular basis, but let me add, our spiritual families need to see that in us as well. They, they need to see us and being an example of those who love to serve the Lord. We, 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 everything we do in honor of God is, is never grievous, it's never a labor, uh, it's, it's, never, it's never something that just feels like this heavy burden all the time. It's, it's what we love to do. It permeates from us that we love the Lord. Because if we serve the Lord solely out of duty, without any love for Him, without any real uh, motivation that's coming deeper than just a sense of duty. And I talked to you last Sunday about the fact, is there duty when it comes to serving God? Yeah, right? There, you could talk about that aspect. There is duty, responsibility. Do this because the Lord said so. There's some of that within Scripture. But the real motivation behind our duty and behind us honoring that is our love for God. And our love for others is the way in so many senses that we demonstrate our love for God uh, as well. We've, that's got to permeate our actions and our purposes uh, as it relates to God. Any thoughts you had? I didn't give you any time on that point last Sunday morning. That's why I wanted to come back to it. Anything you had as it relates to that? Time of love dictates every character or is necessary in every aspect of our lives. Yeah. Every aspect. In every challenge we've generally found ourselves in, you'll probably find someone in that equation that's not acting out of love. And, and that's where the, the challenge is happening or, or the controversy is occurring because love escaped that scene in some way. Any other thoughts you might have had? So let's move on. So, so 
we encourage our brethren to greater discipleship through love. And we talked a little bit about this out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2. And any time, by the way, you see in my notes just the verse reference, I'm referring to chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, our original text. But, but you, can, you can have a wealth of knowledge, right? But no compassion towards other people, and, that, and he says you become what? Yeah, sounding brass. Yeah, you're just noise. You're just noise. Um, you, you could have all kinds of, of informative and powerful things that you could share, great wisdom that you've gained. There, you could have important issues that you would like to share and things that, that are matters in your mind of right and wrong and all of that kind of thing. But if you have zero love behind that, then, then you're just sounding brass, clanging cymbals, just noise, the text says. And we've talked about that a little bit already. Um, in our conversations. And I added this, that love is necessary in the midst of adversity among God's people. And again, we briefly hinted at this on last Sunday's study, but I wanted to make sure we came into Revelation 2 because it's an important text, I believe, um, in this conversation. Go with me over there. Let's talk a little bit about what, what had eluded these folks here in, in Ephesus. So in Revelation 2, verse 1, beginning, he's writing to these seven churches, right? In these, these couple of chapters here in the book of Revelation. And, and what he's saying to these folks is, is, here are some good things potentially about the church, but here are some issues that you need to work on. Here are some corrective measures that maybe need to take place. So notice what's happening with the church at Ephesus. He says, as he writes to them, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works. Who's speaking, by the way? Jesus is, right? This is a moment where John the Revelator is just recording very directly what, what Jesus is communicating to him. And so Jesus says to them, I know your works and your labor and thy patience, and how that canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake, hast labored and hast not fainted. So pause real quick. Are they lazy? No. <laughs> no, they're not lazy. They're, they're very diligent, in fact, he says. Um, are they, in some senses, doing the right things by not putting up with things that are evil and contrary to the will of God? Yes, that, that, he doesn't condemn that here. Um, is it right for them to defend against those who claim to be apostles and who aren't? Yes, he, he hasn't condemned any of that. But here's his problem. In verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. What do you think he means by So he, he, war, he tells them, here are some, some very... You know, you've worked really hard at making sure evil has no place there in the church at Ephesus. You've worked really hard to make sure that anybody who claims to be an apostle who isn't being honest about that is dealt with. You've, you've done diligent work as it comes to that. But he says their problem is they have left thy, their love. What do you think he means by that? I think there is some of that here, Kent, that, that it's, he's trying to remind them <laughs> that it's not just about what you do, but it's about the motivation behind why you're doing it. And a lot of people may think that's semantical, right? A lot of times people might say, well, wh what's it really matter if I get to the end result that I'm looking for, if I get to the right end result in, in these issues, then who cares how it is that I got there? By the way, is that mindset adopted by many a person you might encounter in life? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of people you and I encounter in our lives who don't care about how they get to the end. All they care about is getting to the end result that they desire. That's right. They use that old cliche, right? The ends justify the means. In other words, if I got to the point that I needed and felt like I needed to get to, it doesn't matter how it is that I achieve that. He condemns them for that thought. He says, it's not about what you did. 
It's about the motivation and the reasonings and how it is that you went about it. You've, you've forgotten your, your love for the Lord in this process. If they've forgotten their love for the Lord, then why were they doing these things? Just to be seen. Okay, potentially to be seen. Okay, back to that conversation about out of duty, right? Th- this wasn't their love for the Lord and desire to want to avoid all evils because they love God. This became more about them. This became about them. Th- this was about them being right. This, this was about them saying, that's wrong and this is right. And you're, th- that's an apostle and you're not an apostle and it was about them being right. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything to do with the fact that they loved God. They wanted to be right. They wanted to be right. Instead of letting the Lord be right. And again, that, that may feel like a, a, a kind of a hard line to walk, right? To, to, to know the balance between doing the right things and doing them the right way and doing them with the love that God would, would have us to demonstrate everywhere, all the time. And even in matters of import, even in matters of spiritual things, right? It, and, and I would argue, by the way, that if, if Jesus is demanding, encouraging, teaching them the right way, to honor these duties in spiritual matters, I would argue that, that that would also apply to any aspect of our lives, right? If it's so important in spiritual matters, then I, would, I think I could make a fair argument that it's just as important in all matters then. If it's important in the most important things, then it should be important all the way up to that and not abandon that kind of pr- principle on the earthly side. You've, you've left your first love. You've forgotten why you're doing this. You've, you've forgotten this is about the Lord, not, a, not about you, you being right and you checking a box that, that you honored your duty. Um, I, I fear that, that we, we struggle sometimes finding the balance between doing things out of love for God and His Son and out of responsibility. Because what, what happens is, is we tend to just swing the pendulum, right? We, 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 maybe we see for a period of time where nobody's ever talking about responsibilities and nobody ever talks about duty anymore. And so we swing the pendulum over to this side and we, we, you know, we push hard on this duty and responsibility side. Or then the next guy comes along and says, all I hear is duty, 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 responsibility, responsibility. I, I never hear anything about love. And we swing the pendulum all the way back over on the other side. And, and, and we got to quit swinging the pendulum and, and find the balance God's seeking from us. Do both. Do both. Accept your responsibilities before God, but let love for Him and His Son be the motivator behind it all. And, and recognize who it is that we're actually serving. What he challenged them to do when they recognize this. Yeah. Verse 5 says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now I'm not going to do a dive on the book of Revelation, that's not my intent this morning, but, 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 I, but I, let's think for a minute, very quickly, my understanding of that is, who is the light? Jesus is the light, right? And so this candlestick represents what? What's it do? Yeah, it's re- right, it's, it lights, it represents Him, and so He says, I'm, I'll remove my light from you, I'll remove my identification from you, I'll step away from you. He says that, by the way, to several of these churches here in Asia, um, if they don't repent and make changes. In other words, this isn't a, ch- <laughs> a, a well, it's a good idea. No, no. Jesus says, do this, or I can no longer connect to you. Repent of this idea of only doing the work without loving the Lord properly 
as the motivation. And if you don't repent, I can't continue to connect. But this is thou hast, this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus says, which I what? Which also, I disagree with them too. <laughs> I don't like what they do either. But, but it doesn't mean you can act and behave any way you want and forget who this is about, even though there are very serious matters being addressed. And the point in our lesson that I wanted us to make sure we extract from that is, is that, that even in matters of importance, Jesus says, let love be the motivation. Let that be the reason why I speak, why I, why I encourage, why I correct, why, why I might try to restore. Whatever it is that I'm trying to do for somebody else, make sure, even in matters of import, that love is the motivation. Your thoughts, questions, things you may have thought of when you read through those texts. Let me go to the last points then of, of lesson one here this morning with you. So, go, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for a minute. Because, remember the overall theme of this particular lesson in relationship to this chapter has been how to avoid becoming unprofitable, right? And, and that's kind of the message. Let's, let's, let's go back and read these first three verses together again. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy, right? Chapter 12, he said, what was the greatest gift? Spiritual gift. Prophecy, because it communicated the message of God, right? But even though that might be desirous, let me show you a more excellent way. That's the message. Even though you could do that, even though you have the greatest of spiritual gifts, you can understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though you have the faith to say to a mountain, remove itself. But if you have not charity or love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I could be as generous as generous can be. By the way, is it possible? And the, the idea here is, is it possible to be generous and still be unprofitable? Yeah, and the reason is, if I'm generous, for what purpose? He had to be seen for some ulterior motive to get something back in return, right? That's not love. I could, I could give everything I've got to feed the poor, but if it wasn't motivated by love... It doesn't bring any benefit. I could give my body to be burned. I could, I could make the ultimate sacrifice of my own life. But if it wasn't motivated by love, it profiteth me nothing. No value comes by any act of sacrifice or self-denial or, or of generosity or any of those kinds of things, none of that brings any real benefit if love isn't the motivation. And so be careful even in our sacrifices because they can become unprofitable and empty um, if, if we're not careful. Let me run you over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Here's this principle of self-denial. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Motivated by love, that kind of self-denial and sacrifice then becomes what? Profitable. It becomes profitable then. Now I've got real benefit to this. My love for the Lord, self-denial, becomes profitable. Can I encourage you to appreciate in, in family lives that selfishness is a destroyer? Selfishness is a destroyer of the home. And, and I, don't, I don't have... I probably don't have to prove that to you. I, I could anecdotally just 
to start sharing with you. The, the many a time I've sat at a kitchen table or on the couch in my living room or wherever it might be and addressing and trying to help somebody through some challenge and the vast, vast majority of the time somebody in that equation is thinking about self first. And it's creating the barrier or the challenge that, that is difficult to overcome. Selfishness will deplete love in a home, lot, home environment instantaneously. And there's going to have to be a balance in our willingness to be sacrificial toward, for one another, right? Right? And, and sometimes I, I'm the receiver of people's sacrificial service, and sometimes I am the giver of sacrificial service. But when that becomes lopsided inside of homes, certainly when it becomes lopsided in our relationship with Jesus, when we're not denying self and honoring Him, it, it's consequential. But it becomes consequential in our home lives, as well, I read the other day, happy Father's Day, by the way, to all the fathers in the room. But, uh, but I, I read the other day, somebody said, all I want for Father's Day is to be allowed to golf on Mother's Day. <laughs> hmm. Sounds real self-sacrificing, doesn't it? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. That, that's, but, right? That, but I know that's a joke, but, but the point is, is true, though. That's the way a lot of people are. <laughs> I, I wanted all for me and whatever benefits me is is what i'm going to pursue and what happens sometimes in families is we will pursue self at all costs and we'll sacrifice marriages we'll sacrifice children relationships we'll sacrifice all kinds of things in the process other than being sacrificial to the family life <laughs> we'll give that up to pursue self and Jesus I think teaches us a very valuable principle and what we have to kind of teach ourselves is is to make these sacrifices without regret because if if I make a sacrifice, but I keep it in the back of my mind all the time. I, I, I know a person one time that kept a notebook of everything they ever did for their parents. So that when, if the conversation ever came up later about who did what, you could pull out the notebook and say, here's, here's who... I don't know about that, right? I'm not so sure about that. About the challenges that can present. Just, just share with me for a minute. Go to John 19. John 19, verse 26. It may seem like an interesting passage of Scripture to go to, but... But I want you to notice something. Jesus is, is, do, is doing what, by the way? He's on the cross. I, I have always been moved in tremendous ways by the fact Jesus said how many things from the cross? Seven. Seven things that Jesus says while He's dying upon the cross. One of those seven is what? Woman, behold thy son. <laughs> Here in verse 26 of John 19. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother woman, Behold thy son. We pretty much have concluded just by language that that's probably referring to John, um, just by the kinds of things that is said about John in other narratives. Again, he's not named, but that's general conclusion people make. Irregardless, he looks down at his disciples and picks out the one whom he loved, is described that way, and says, Woman, woman behold thy son. Take, take care of my mother. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, from that hour, that disciple took her unto what? 
unto his own home. He sacrificed for not his own mother, but the mother of the Lord. And it appears, and again, simple language, right? But it appears to have happened without hesitation, without, without questioning, well, there's 11 other of us, oh, well, 10, sorry, right? 10 other of us here that, that, that could be involved in this. Why, why not want? No, there seems to be none of that indication here. What about all those other relation, family relations connected? Right. My, my point is, no regret, right? No, no, no concern about how much sacrifice, what's the limit, and, and, and all those kinds of things. And... and I think sometimes we, we, we make the mistake sometimes of, of almost looking back at re, with regret. Well, I, I did all of these things, and now it's about me because I had to make all these sacrifices all this time in order to, to, to help my aging parents or whatever it might have been. And, and I think Jesus' example here with John illustrates to us that we've got to avoid that kind of thinking. What, whatever service we render to, to aid and assist our parents is not is not something to be looked at as regret and, and, and as, as something that to, to, you know, to view as negative. This is, this is the love that I had for them that motivated that. I, this is the love that I had and the appreciation of what they provided for me um, over the years. Now, now, I didn't say you can't ask for help, by the way. And I, I didn't say that at some point, and there are certain limitations to your physical abilities, your, uh, your, um, even your intellectual abilities in terms of what to know, how to handle certain health circumstances. I get that. I'm not, not trying to imply that you can never seek additional aid and help be, because many hit a point where you don't have any choice but to seek that. But what I'm saying is don't regret what you do for your parents. If you serve them out of love, if you serve them out of, out of your compassion for them and your appreciation for them, then just let that be enough. Because I've seen a lot who look back and they see maybe the years, maybe long stretches of time where, where they've had to care uh, for an aging or, or health-dependent parent and at the end of that, you might look at that as, well, look at all this, this time that I had to spend, and now it's about me, and, and we've just got to be careful that we don't let that sacrifice deplete the love we have, not only for our parents, but, but for, for others um, in the process. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 11. Parents are going to make sacrifices on behalf of their children. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> it's just a fact, right? It, 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 it's part of being a parent and, and choosing, in some senses, to be such. In Luke chapter 11, verse 11, he says, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that, that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he, for a fish give him a, a serpent? It, you know, in, in other words, we provide what our children what? What they need, right? What, what they need. Now, you know, sometimes what they want, and sometimes we make sacrifices on behalf of what they want, but, but, but certainly I don't look at it as regrettable of, of the things that, that, you know, you have to sacrifice on, on behalf uh, of your children. And... and yeah, it, 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 it may mean at times there are certain things that you would love to do or would like to do or would, would like to have and all those kinds of things, and you may have to push the brakes on that and say, right now, this is the priority in my life. Um, and, you know, a little bit of an old... I'm not picking on you here, but we're old. All of us here for a lot of, you know, more grandparents sitting here 
than, than parents with children at home, right? If you just look around the room. Um, but but I, let me encourage you know, young parents in particular to realize that, that that time is fleeting. And I don't, I don't look back at, at the last, I do the math, 26 years with re- regret at all. In, in fact, there are some things that Deborah and I like about the fact that we kind of have pretty much grown children now. And there's some things that we don't, <laughs> right? It, someday, six-year-olds were a lot easier than 21-year-olds, <laughs> right? And yet, I don't look back at regret at anything we did or any of the sacrifices we, we made. And I'm not t- saying that to try to... I'm trying to illustrate to you. We, why, right? Why would I do that? Because if I do that, is it going to change any of it? No, it won't change a bit of it. But now I'm miserable because of it. Love left, I became unprofitable. Because now all I think about is everything I did and all the sacrifices I made, and now I'm miserable. And I can't change one, one moment of it. Embrace it all, right? Embrace it all. But, but you and I, because we love our children, we're going to make sacrifices for them. And, and I'm a, I don't want to ever imply that, that you ever stop, right? Because your love for your children never stops. Um, the roles change, and the, and the ability to have influence changes at times, but, but the love never stops um, on, on behalf of our children uh, simply because they hit adulthood. Um, and it doesn't mean the questions stop either um, uh, along the way. Anything else you might have thought of when it comes to that aspect? So go to Ephesians 5 with me. Again, all motivated out of love, but yet sacrifice. In verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5, he said, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, a lot of guys would like to have that text stop right there. Right? Because because then they feel authoritative. But he didn't finish there. What he said in light of that... Now, I'm not... By the way, I'm not saying that, that, that none of that is true. That relationship, that's the way the relationship works, and that's the order that God gave. But there's a way for that to work. How does it work? It works when husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. We look at the word submission and assume that's the sacrificial side of the relationship. Not according to Paul. Paul said that's the order of the relationship. The sacrificial side of the relationship comes from the husband. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The sacrificial side comes on the husbands. And I, I simply encourage everyone in this room, if you're, if you're a husband and married, that you, that you recognize that this... This prioritized relationship that Paul describes here in Ephesians chapter 5 is is effective when both the wife and the husband are fulfilling their their roles in the manner in which God has prescribed. And what I have often witnessed among many a husband is they demand the submission (laughs) with no ounce of sacrifice being offered on their part and then they wonder why the relationship's challenged and why they're having difficulties because love isn't motivating either one of them anymore all it is is authority and demands and 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 there's no love actually motivating the decisions and choices that they're making um, as as husbands 
uh, and wives. Does that mean the wife will never make a sacrifice on behalf of her husband? Certainly not. Certainly not. Deb's been putting up with me for a long, long time, right? Making all kinds of sacrifices for a long, long time. But, but, but at the end of the day, when, when it comes down to having to do certain, then that, that role falls right here. Um, that role falls right here in relationship to what God desires. And brethren need to be thinking about the same things. In Ephesians, or Acts chapter 4, real quick. In Acts chapter 4. In verse 36. If you remember, the, there were needs that arose there in Judea when all those folks stayed in Jerusalem after the feast and after they'd heard about Jesus and, and Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite in the, of the county of Cyprus, or country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. We learn early on among brethren, that they were extremely sacrificial because of their love for each other. Even so much so that they were, were willing to sell a piece of property and take the proceeds from that sale and set it at the feet of the apostles and say, use that for whomever needs it. From the very early goings of the Lord's family, love motivated sacrifice. So don't sacrifice for the sake of sacrificing. But let love move us to make those sacrifices on behalf of our parents, on behalf of our children, our spouses, our church family, whomever it may be. Just make sure that love is motivating it because I could make some of the greatest sacrifices ever seen of man. I could be the most generous guy ever seen. But if love isn't the reason, I am unprofitable, according to Paul's message in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay, Lord willing, we come back Wednesday night. We're going to jump to lesson two. Um, lesson two in this series. Somewhere the